itetzeik. Um, if a fire should go out, umatza, and it should find. It's all like very random. It just it goes out and it happens to find kotzim dried reeds and thorns. Venechal gadish or hakama or asade, and the produce or the wheat or the field of another person gets consumed. Shalem yeshalem hamavir et habeira. The person who lit the fire, who caused the fire to burn, will be responsible for payment. And and as you you fully aware in the in the Torah when we look at at psukim in the Torah, it's not just the the, the literal translation of, of the pasuk that we're concerned about. We're also looking at um, some of the philosophy and the meaning that's in the pasuk, which is given to us through the words that are chosen. So, for example, this very passive element of of esh ki tetze esh, it fire goes out, it happens to find. And we know that that's often the case, that it's not that easy to direct fire to a specific target. Usually when fire causes damage, it is because of the fact that the fire is out of control, not because the fire is in control. And the Nemuka Yosef comments, we'll do some more Nemuka Yosef a little little bit later, but he he then says the Gemara that we're going to be looking at, if this is just rather passive, ki a fire went out. Um, I might have lit a fire in my own property, which I'm perfectly entitled to do. I'm having a barbecue, just had Thanksgiving weekend, and we've had a big barbecue in the in the house. And after after the, the luncheon, uh, we went to watch TV and to have a rest, and nobody worried about the fire. We thought the fire was on its way out. Uh, but it wasn't on its way out. It caught fire, it burnt, and it carried on across my property and entered the property of my neighbor and, and caused damage there. So this is the Nebuch Yosef is The Posuk is implying that it happened by itself. It wasn't directed. It wasn't deliberate. Uh, and, and it started off in a perfectly okay place in my own property, uh, but it moved. Uvai Talmud, and what the Gemara wants to know is Mishumai Machayve. So, what are you, why are you Chayev? What are you responsible for? You lit a fire where you're allowed to light it. Uh, you didn't do anything to make the fire go any further. It was all a mistake. It was all un- unintentional. And what exactly am I responsible for? What have I done here? What is the action? In, in the Zikin, we've got to look at the, uh, at the object that is causing the damage. So, in this case, it's fire. And fire is intangible, so I'm not sure that yet that fire could be an object. And secondly, what is the action that co- causes this? And then Wiki Yosef goes on to say, The the Torah regards the owner of the fire, which is I, who lit it in my property to start with, regards me as the Mavir, as if I took the fire and lit my neighbor's field with that fire. That's the Mavir. So although the, the verse starts off in a very passive form, when it comes to the culpability, to the payment, uh, it's he who caused the fire to burn uh, that is responsible and that has to pay. So the Gemara discusses what is this payment for? What is the actual action of, of Nezek that, that took place? And we have two views, Rabbi Yochanan and Rosh Lakish. And you know Rabbi Yochanan and Rosh Lakish, they were brothers-in-law, they were close friends. And Rabbi Yochanan was Makari of Rosh Lakish. Um, some people don't realize that the Kirov movement started long before the 1970s. Uh, and, and Rabbi Yochanan was a big Makari of Rosh Lakish. Um, and, and he then married Rabbi Yochanan's sister, and they were very close chabruses, as we know. But they had different views of the world. They have different world views, which caused them to understand halakha differently in many situations. So just as we have Abaya and Rava, with two different world views, looking at the world through their different lenses and coming to different conclusions, so Rabbi Yochanan and Reish Lakish also have different ways of looking at the world. And in this particular case, Rabbi Yochanan says something very uh, original, very innovative. What's happened here is you've got to treat fire. You can't treat fire like any of the other forms of damages. It's not an ox and it's not a pit. 
uh, or a stumbling block in Rishut Arabim, it's much more like Chitzav, like a, a bullet, or in those days, an arrow. Uh, so if I shoot a bullet and I cause damage in my neighbor's property, clearly I'm responsible. What am I responsible for? That's the idea of Chetz. I did something which initiated a, an event for which I'm responsible. And we'll see what why that's important and what it means. Fire is like any other tangible thing, just like you've got an ox, you've got a pit, various things that you are responsible for because they are yours. Fire too, although it's intangible, you are responsible for because it's yours. You lit it. You lit it in your in your neighborhood, in your property, and you are responsible for it. The Gemara goes on to analyze these two views. Resh Lakish, my time Rabbi Yochanan. Why does Resh Lakish not learn the way Rabbi Yochanan does? What's his problem with Rabbi Yochanan's worldview? Um, Rabbi Resh Lakish looks at the case of Chitzim. Yes, you're right that if I shoot an arrow or I fire a gun, and I cause damage, I am responsible, but that's because it's my energy. It's my force. I just, I weaponized the arrow. I weaponized the, the bullet. I and, and a weapon is an extension of me. The same as I could punch the person in the face or I could shoot an arrow uh, into the person. In both cases, it's my energy and I'm simply using the object as a weapon. But fire is not a weapon and fire is not the result of the individual's car. It's not his force. It's not his energy which causes the fire to, to burn. Uh, it's, it's blown by the wind and by the fuel that it finds. Rabbi Yochanan, my time, And why does Rabbi Yochanan not learn like Reish Lakish, who said that it's it's like your property? Something is yours if it's tangible. You can't own something which is intangible, which is an interesting discussion all on its own because it actually borders on the whole discussion around intellectual property. Can you really own an idea? Can you own something which is not which is not physical? Um, and and Rabbi Yochanan says no. If for, in order to own something, it has to be a tangible object. If it's not a tangible object, it's a force. It's energy. You don't own energy. Uh, and therefore, you are responsible because you initiated the energy, not because you own it. Now, there's quite a difference as to whether we treat it as mamon or we treat it as, as chitzav, because if we treat it, for example, as chitzav, then it's adam hamazik. It's the human being causing the damage. It's not the object causing the damage. I'm causing the damage using a weapon. And in this case, I'm causing the damage using using fire. And in such a case... For example, if a person gets killed by the fire, I'm culpable, I'm responsible for that, because it's as if I killed the person. Um, if we say it's Mishum Mamono, then the fire killed the person, it wasn't me who killed, and it's not a, it, it's not an, an act of murder by any means, if we say it's Mishum Mamono. If it's Mishum Chitzav, this is the human being who caused the damage, then I'm responsible for all sorts of things. So if, an, if I damage another person, if another person got burnt by my fire, and because of that, he couldn't go to work. I've got to pay him shevet. I've got to pay him his unemployment. If he has to see the doctor, I've got to pay ripui. If he's suffering pain, I've got to pay. I've got to pay tsar. There are all sorts of payments I've got to pay. If it's a human being that caused the damage, whereas if it's my assets, my property that has caused the damage, I don't have those same responsibilities. And so the, there are some fundamental differences between Rabbi Yochanan's view of what fire is. And Resh Lakish's view of what fire is. Now, what's, the, what's, the what's the difference between digging a bore and leaving the bore open in public and lighting a fire and not taking care to make sure that the fire is out before you went inside to rest? Uh, so, Alan, an, an important distinction. The one is that a bore is in Rishut Arabim. I dig the, the pit in the Rishut Arabim, in the public domain. The fire I light in my own domain. So this is mobile, whereas the pit isn't. So in the case of the bar, I'm completely responsible. The pit is where I put it. It's where I dug it. It didn't go anywhere. I'm completely responsible. In this case, the initiation of the fire was all done beheter. 
I was doing nothing wrong. Yes, subsequently, I didn't take enough care. And the Gomorrah goes into the whole discussion. Uh, could I have foreseen that it was going to go to my neighbor's uh, uh, yard? Was there an intervening wall which maybe came down later on? Why Why did it go? Why didn't I take care? The Gomorrah goes into all of those things. But the main difference between Bor and Aish is that Aish is mobile and Bor is static. Um, so, so it's more of a Chidush. Aish is... But each has its own chidush. The chidush of bor is that even though it's in Rishut Rabim, it's not mine. I don't own it, and it's not in my property. I'm still responsible for it. And in the case of Esh, the chidush is even though it, it starts off beheter and it then travels of its own accord, I still remain responsible for it. So in this machlokas, we're going to now zoom into Rabbi Yochanan. Uh, we're going to zoom into Resh Lakish, who says it's because of Mamono, his money. And we see Rashi in that third line of Rashi, Kashoro Uvoro Shehiziku. It's exactly the same as if your ox or your bull cause damage. The Kasal Kadatach, and at this point the Gemara assumes, the Ika Benayo, the Gonshi Hidlik Begachelet Sheinoshelo. Now the Gemara moves off this later on, but right now the Gemara assumes, says Rashi, that you need to own something according to Resh Lakish. So Rabbi Yochanan says this is intangible. Fire is intangible. Rashi like says yes, but it doesn't start with something with something intangible. It starts with a burning ember. It starts with a burning coal. Who owns that coal? If you own that coal, then everything that results from that burning coal is yours. You own it. But if you don't own the burning coal, um, it, it was somebody else who did that. So we're having this this Fourth uh, of July barbecue. And um, and you bring the coal. You say to me, well, you're providing the meal. That's great. I'll bring the coal. And you bring the coal and you don't give it to me. It's your coal. And we light the fire with your coal. Am I still responsible for that? Rashi says no. According to Rabbi Yochanan, at the corner to Rash Lakish, at this stage of the discussion, I would not be responsible. To Rabbi Yochanan, Chayib, according to Rabbi Yochanan, I would, to Chitzavim, because this is my energy. I've set this in motion. Or Rash Lakish, Patur, the love Mamanohu. So that's important to understand in Rashi, that Rashi takes this very literally and says that Resh Lakish's view that the Aish is, you are responsible for the Aish because it started off with a tangible object that is yours. That coal is yours. In that case, when the coal is not yours, in a circumstance where the coal is not yours, you would not be Chayev. Um Tosfot, two, two very important pieces of Tosfot. The first one, Isho Mishum Chitzav, taking Rabbi Yochanan's view, Lo Shiyav Irba Atzmo Ha'esh, he doesn't have to cause the fire to, to catch a, a light in his neighbor's field. Ela kol makom shepasha velo shamar gachalto chitzav ninu. Not taking care of your fire is equivalent to shooting the arrow. Uh, so pshia, although an act of commission, an act of omission, is treated as an act of commission. It's an interesting halachic concept that pshia is not just, well, I didn't do what I should have done, I'm sorry. No, it's actually as if you shot the gun, uh, even though it was it was just a matter of, of carelessness. Um, and that, I mean, this is quite interesting in, in, for example, when you think of gun control in the United States at the moment and so on, if somebody... If somebody gets hold of a gun, of my gun, uh, carelessly because of my own carelessness, I might be very liable for that uh, because an act of carelessness is considered initiation of Esh. The second Tosfot about Ishu Mishu Mamono, Klomar Chiyuv Mamono Yeshbo Veloshi HaEshel, the fire doesn't have to belong to him. It means Chiyuv Mamono, it's treated the same way as any other of his assets that cause the damage, like the ox, like the shore, and therefore he wouldn't have to pay unemployment and medical fees and all the things that a human being has to pay. He wouldn't have to pay because according to Reish Lakish, it is treated as mamono, as his his property that caused the damage, not himself. Veloshiyah ha'ishor, it doesn't have to be his fire. Da'filu hidlik ba'eshel acher chayav, he disagrees directly with Rashi. Rashi says, you're only chayav if the coal belonged to you. Tosfus says, don't take it so literally. That's not what Rabbi Yochanan, not what Rish Lakish means. Rish Lakish means that you treat it as if it is your own. Veloka perish akuntras Tosfus goes on to say, not like Rashi. To perish to ike benayo dadlik begachel she'en shalom. Where Rashi says the difference between Rish Lakish and Rabbi Yochanan would be in a coal which doesn't belong to the person. 
Uh, Tosfa says it's got nothing to do with who owns the coal. You are treated as the owner of the fire metaphorically. It's not something which is necessarily physically yours. So that's the piece of Gomorrah with Rashi and Tosfus. Any Any questions on that piece? Fred, are you, you're on mute. If someone lights a coal in his private domain, but a wind comes and takes the flame and brings it to his neighbor's domain, if there was no wind, the fire would not have spread. How do we how do we judge? So, so there again, there might be a difference between Resh Lakish and Rabbi Yochanan. According to Rabbi Yochanan, that it's Adam Amazek. This is a human being really causing the damage. It's like firing the gun. We have a principle further on that uh, Adam Mu'ad Olam, a, a human being has never got the excuse that it was beyond my control. It's a very interesting concept. We're dealing with it now in Dachav Hey, Bachavav, Kav Zayin. We're dealing with that that idea right now in in the Shirim. Uh, that a human being has never got an excuse of this was beyond my control. Uh, it's, it's fascinating that that every your oxid can be beyond your control, the fire can be. But if a issue, if as Rabbi Yochanan says, this is like Adam Amazik, then he can never claim it was a wind. Sorry, not my fault. Always your fault. If you cause damage, you're the agent of the damage, you, and you're culpable. Even though he was permitted to light it in his own property. He, uh, he didn't do anything wrong there, and it would not have happened, it would not have caused damage if it wasn't for the wind, which is different from a from a, from a chetz. A chetz is his power that shoots the arrow. That's what Rabbi Yochanan says. But the wind is not in the control and the power of the man. It seems like uh, this is different from what Rabbi Yochanan Well, says. that that very difference is why Reish Lakish doesn't doesn't treat it that way. He says you can't treat fire like a chetz because it's not his energy; it's it's the wind that blows it. And we're not we're not talking about a case where he specifically or negligently does it. But according to Rabbi Yochanan, he he's willing to treat it as chetz. He says I don't care that it's the wind that does it. A person needs to know when they light a fire, there is the potential for wind, even if there's no wind at that time. Uh, and and therefore the person is always culpable. But he uses the uh, analogy of a chetz, which is which cannot travel on its own, as opposed to wind. I I would question Rabbi Yochanan on, on that basis, just on on his own thinking. There's a there's a uh, material difference between a chetz and wind. Chetz requires the man to use his power, whereas wind does not. If he uses the analogy of chase, it seems as if it should not hold for wind, according well, to his own logic. According to his own logic, right, right. Well, what he would look at is the the equivalency between shooting the arrow, which is the man's action, the man's energy, would be igniting the fire. The fact that the fire then travels with the help of the wind. There, you're right. That's why Rish Lakish objects. Because thereafter, it travels with the help of the wind. If there was no wind, it would be static. Uh, whereas in the case of the chetz, it continues to travel because of the energy of, of the human. So it's a very big chidush of Rabbi Yochanan to say that this is because of, of, of Esh. Where the Gemara lands up at the end is to say that Rabbi Yochanan, and we paskin like Rabbi Yochanan, um, where the Gemara lands up at the end is that Rabbi Yochanan agrees that it works as mamon as well. In cases where you can't hold you responsible for for fire, for reasons such as you describing, we still hold you responsible because it's your mamon. But but what Rabbi Yochanan says is there's an added layer of Adam, that in addition to this being your asset, your property which is causing the damage, where applicable, it is also your energy. And since it's your energy, the laws are much stricter. But, but what you what you're struggling with is exactly what is Chavrusa, what Reish Lakish struggled with and said, I think this is going too far. Uh, you, you're making an analysis, and I understand that you consider Aish as intangible and therefore not as Mamono. You see, it has to be one of the two. It's either your money or it's your or it's your energy. Uh, those are the only two things that can be. And we know the Torah says you're obligated. So you're obligated for one of those two reasons. Reish Lakish looks at it and says, it's easier for me to say you're obligated it for your money, even though it's intangible. At least the coal that started it wasn't intangible. 
Rabbi Yochanan says it's easier for me to say it's your energy, even though the wind is involved, because this isn't something tangible. This is this is energy. Fire is energy, and it's an energy that you initiated. And and we'll see it go one step further in the Nemechi Yosef story. It's interesting that in the Plukta uh, between Rabbi Yochanan and Rabbi Shlakish, I think there's something like 900 different instances where they uh, discuss something. I think we the psak is like Rish Lakish, I think, in about six times out of over 900. Correct. Right. There are very few of them are, are Rish Lakish. Generally, we pass out Rabbi Yochanan, and this is no and this is no exception. And that's because of the world views. It's not they're not six or eight or nine hundred, however many there are, just different machlokot. They all result from the way they understand the halakha to operate. They come from different worlds. They, they come from different worlds. They do. Um, now we're looking at... Sorry. One, one more question. I'm sorry. Why don't we talk about the inaction? If, if, if I don't... If I didn't check the weather forecast and I lit my fire and it was very windy, I shouldn't have lit my fire outside. If I don't tie up my animal in in my yard and it goes out and damages something, I'm responsible. Um, I think the Gemara was talking about the other day about uh, a, a dog with a cookie and a, and a coal and, you know, all, all that stuff. So the inaction is something that needs to be considered as well, I think. T totally. And that's the that's the Tosfus, Alan, that, that, that we did here, that first Tosfus. Um, by not taking care over your fire, they become your arrows. So an arrow just sitting on your table is not that is not dangerous. Uh, you need to shoot it, but but and and then when you shoot it, it, it takes on your energy and it and becomes dangerous. But the fire, even just stationary in your yard, is already dangerous. Right. Uh, and and you need to become proactive in order to protect it. If you don't, you are held reliable. That Shia becomes an action, exactly as you're saying. Um, so we're looking at at three Rishonim here um, th that we use a lot. They're all very familiar to you. Uh, and, and it's the Nemuki Yosef that we're going to be most interested in. The, the first is the Rashbo. So this is 13th century Spain. Um, a Rishon in the middle of the period of Rishonim from the school of the Ramban and, and what he says that's important to hear for us uh, is that he understands us the way Tosfot does um, that Reish Lakish Amar Isho Mishum Mamono Perish Rashi that means that he's using his own a piece of coal that belonged to him Ela Tosfot Amru that's not so um, but what we're doing over here is um, it's as if you're physically doing it. It's like your body. You're just extending your limbs. The, the arrow is an extension of your own limb. And, and so the fire is an extension of your own limb. But Reish Lakish, you are only obligated where your property would be obligated. You don't take on all the additional obligations of a human damager. However, that obligation for your for your property applies even if the coal doesn't belong to you. So he clearly goes like Tosfot and not like not like Rashi. Um, the Rosh is important to us as well. Um, the Rosh, as you know, is, is, is extremely important. The Rosh learned, his, his Rebbe was the Maharam Rutenberg from Germany. The Maharam Rutenberg is the tail end of the Tosfut school, um, and, and particularly the German Tosfut school, but not only the Tosfut school. And he takes the, the, all the amazing learning and reasoning and logic of Tosfut and begins to codify it. The Rosh takes that work further and, and codifies the Tosfot's thinking into, into law, into, into halakha. Um, and her, here he says, in, on, in the case of Rabbi Yochanan, even if he lives it in his own property, then he's of dalad varim. He has to pay for all the things that a human being would have to pay for, unemployment and medicine and, and pain and everything. 
Im Nisraf Adam Chayalav Ki'iru Hargo Be'adayim. And if a human being is burned to death, the person who lit the fire is obligated as if he did it with his own hands. Reish Lakish, however, says it's Mamono. Im lo shamar gachalto ki'ilu mamono mazik. Once again, Alan, this is similar to your point, by the passive, uh, the passivity of not protecting the coal, that makes it yours. It wasn't yours before, but by ignoring it, you're taking responsibility. We're holding you responsible because you were you were posher. Vahalachak Rabbi Yochanan, the Gabi Reish Lakish, and we passed like Rabbi Yochanan. Now, it's the Nimuki Yosef that I really want to look at. And the Nimuki Yosef, we now move into 5th century, 15th century Spain. And the Nimuki Yosef is so important because for a number of reasons. Firstly, he bridges the medieval and the modern period. So his 16th century already is just at the end of the period of Rishonim, edging on the beginning of the time of the Acharonim. So he's already thinking more like one of the Acharonim who we're more familiar with. His language is more like the Acharonim. So he's very accessible. We understand him. We get him. Uh, and, and he's really a Talmud of, of, of the Ran and the Ritvo um, and, and, uh, and, and the Ra'o. I mean, he he's comes from that whole school of the Ramban, but he's at the end of it. So in Spain, all the Torah of North Africa through the Rif and others comes and all the Torah of the Balei Tosfot come through the Ramban and the Rashbo and others. And in Spain, they mix together. That's why Spain is so important in the period of the Rishonim. And the Nemuke Yosef is at the end of the period of the Rishonim. So he has the opportunity to learn of all these different schools of thought and to uh, distill it. And he distills it magnificently and delivers it to us on a plate in a way that's very easy to understand. And the Nimuki Yosef asks the kind of question, here's a great example that you won't often find a Rishon asking. This is the kind of question that an, an Acheron would ask. It's a much more modern kind of question. Here's the question. You might have the question. How can you light candles on Friday afternoon? And the candles are lechet v'nigmeret b'shabbat. If you tell me that fire is like a hetz, so I fire the arrow, I, I, I let the, the arrow off at one o'clock, and at two minutes past one, it shatters somebody's window. Even though it's two minutes after I did it, I'm responsible for that shattering. It's as if I've shattered the window. If Aish works that way, if Aish, Aish is an extension of my body, and when the arrow shatters the window, or the fire shatters the window, it's as if I shattered the window. Then when my Shabbos candles are burning on Shabbos, it's if, as if I am burning them on Shabbos. And how can I leave? And this comes into questions of time switches. It comes into all sorts of interesting questions. Can I set something in motion on Friday, and then when Shabbat comes in, say, I'm not involved, I'm, I'm finished, I've done my bit, it's no malacha, I'm not doing anything. Says the Nebuchadnezzar Yosef, from this understanding of Rabbi Yochanan of the way Aish works, it appears to me that you are responsible for what you initiate until it's finished its trajectory. And that would mean you can't light Friday night candles on ever, because if you lit them on Friday, they would burn on Shabbos, and you can't light them on Shabbos, so you can't light Friday night candles. Um and, and he gives some other examples. And then he says four lines down in the bold print, Ki ayen b'milta shapir lo kashilan. And he gives you a hint of, of how he works and many of the Rishonim work, but this is typical of Namuki Yosef. You have a question he's saying because you haven't got to first principles. Get to first principles and you won't have a question. What does he mean by that? Shaharei chiyuvo mishum chitzav kezorei chachetz. Yes, a fire is like shooting an arrow. When the arrow leaves the bow, at that moment, everything is done. Nothing more needs to be done. This is not a continuous action that starts with firing the arrow and ends with it hitting the window. De'i chashvinan le'i havalan le'miftere de'anushu. 
Because if we did say that, we would have to say his patur altogether, which would be absurd. So Hamas would fire a rocket. It lands on a building in Tel Aviv. And the Hamas guy says, oops, I'm sorry. I would have liked to have stopped it. I, I suddenly noticed it was making its way to Tel Aviv, but there was nothing I could do beyond my control. I'm an onus. And so even if you judge me in your own based in, you're going to have to find that I'm free because when I fired it, that was nothing wrong. I just let it rocket off. People do that all the time and, and, and you know, Independence Day and other times they, they set off rockets. The fact that it's now heading to your building in Tel Aviv, I'm sorry, there's nothing I can do about it. Perhaps you've got an iron dome. Maybe you can do something about it. I can no longer do anything about it. Of course, that's absurd. Therefore, says the the Newika Yosef, our response to our response to the, to the little Hamas fire, rocket fire it would be, no, the moment you fired it, you did everything. The action was complete. The building in Tel Aviv was blown up already. The fact that we were able to intervene, you're just lucky, but but you've done your damage the moment you've let it go. She'en because he can't put it back. And that's going to be the most important phrase for the, the essence of what I, I want to learn with you today. That when you set something in motion that you cannot retrieve, the entire damage is done at the moment of initiation of the movement. It's not a long extended thing. One, if you can't pull it back, if you still have control, if it's a drone and you can pull the drone back, then you're only obligated when the drone does its damage. But if it's a rocket that once you've released it, it can no longer be brought back, then you are completely higher. And then he says at the bottom, When you started this fire, the candle, you started it on Friday. And at that, it's as if you finished everything at that moment. What you did at that moment was you lit four hours of ignition, four hours of combustion you lit at that moment. Then it goes on, but you've lit the four hours of combustion. There was enough fuel in it, and you lit the fire, and it didn't need any more human intervention. And, and in fact, at that point, you can't even pull it back. To let be Isur Hashiv, at that place, time you were doing nothing wrong. It was Friday. And therefore, your action is, is mutar, it's permissible, and, and you've done nothing wrong. Now, what's important when, when we learn is th that we look at Torah in its entirety, that we look at Torah holistically. And that means we look at, at, at its various different dimensions, including its ethical dimension and its metaphysical dimension. Even though we might be learning about something very linear, something very specific in laws of damages, there is always an ethical dimension and there's always a spiritual kind of cosmic metaphysical dimension as well. Now, we won't use those dimensions to draw conclusions. You can't use the ethics of a halakha to draw a conclusion. Uh, and, and to reason with the halakha. You can't use the metaphysics of the halakha to reason with it. When you're reasoning with, reasoning with halakha, you have to use halakhic reasoning, which is, which is quite mathematical in its approach. It has to be logical. But to understand the halakha, to make it meaningful, we, we need to look at it from its ethical perspective as well. And so here we're talking about lighting fires in your neighbor's yard and, um, and, and shooting arrows and... and uh, all sorts of lighting candles on Friday, all sorts of interesting things. But that's not the, the, the soul of it. The soul of it goes deeper than that. The, the, the soul of it is, it, it's by the way, the Vilna Gaon says, for example, on the Posik in, in Mishle, know Hashem in all your ways, in all your ways, in everything you do in your life, see Hashem in that, see the Torah in that. And the Vilna Gaon says that in, in Mishle that the He and the Vav, Da E Hu, means Da Hu. He and Vav, the He is Chumash, and the Vav is Mishne. The, the Shisai Shisidre Mishnah and the Hamishah Chumshe Torah. So He and Vav is the rational Torah, the, the Torah Shabbat Peh that we have. And what Mishle is saying, Bechol Durachecha, in all your ways, Da E Hu, know Gemara, know the Talmud know how to learn, know how to reason. And then the next part of the Fosik is, and it 
will keep you straight. And Orach, the Vilna Gon learns, means in a more mystical sense. And he says, Vahu is Hevav and an Aleph. So if you think of it, it's very nice to think of when you see the word anytime in the Torah, that Hevav is the, the linear Torah and Aleph is the mystical Torah. Aleph is the silent Torah, the mysterious Torah that we learn from. And when you put it together, it's Hu. When you learn the whole thing, you, you get the full sense of it. And that's the idea of these matmonim that I teach, is to be able to reason with the, with the Gemara halachically and then penetrate more deeply to look at the soul. What is the soul of this idea that we're learning? And we come to a piece here of Reishis Chochma. The Reishis Chochma was Rabbi Leo de Vidash, who lived in Tzfat in the 16th century during the Kabbalistic period. He was a Talmud of Rabbi Moshe Kordavira. So if you look at the whole Kabbalistic tradition in Tzfat, we have Rabbi Shlomo Alkabetz, who wrote the Lechad Odi, and we've got um, his Talmud is Rabbi Moshe Kordavira and the Beis Yosef, the author of the Shulchan Aruch. Both learn from, from Rabbi Shlomo Alkabetz. And the Reish Yitzchokma learns from two people. He learns from Rabbi Moshe Kordavira, who was the Rebbe of the Ari also. So it's this... He's at the source of the Kabbalistic school, and the Yerush Hashem learns from Moshe Kodavira, and he learns from Rabbi Yosef Karo. Imagine having two rabbi in Makkah sitting in Tzfat in the 16th century, and you learn in the morning with Rabbi Moshe Kodavira, in the afternoon you learn with Rabbi Yosef Karo. Just imagine what that is. And we've got his sefer, the Yerush Hashem, is where he melds all this together and he brings a, a very interesting synthesis of Kabbalah and Musar the ethics of the Torah and the mysticism of the Torah together. And here he brings a Tana de Be'elio, and in Tzai Tzlena B'Ketivat Yad, I found the tav- a Tana de Be'elio, says the Rosh Hashanah, in manuscript form, it hasn't been published. Ze Lashono, and this is what it says. Ze Sha'amar HaKatuv, B'Shot Lashon Te'chabe, um, he, he talks about the, the, the power of, of the tongue, and he says, "Mipnei she kashe lashon hara mi cherev, mi she yesh biyado cherev umevakesh la haroget chaviro imevakesh la zor bo chazer she adain he bishuto." If you have a sword in your hand and you decide you want to kill somebody, you're really angry. You pull your sword out out of the sheath, and you really want to kill this person. You have time to change your mind until you actually kill him. At any point, you can retrieve it. But if a person wants to kill somebody with an arrow, or a gun, or a rocket, or a bomb, once you've shot the arrow, you can't pull it back again. That's the Nimuki Yosef, isn't it? So the, the Reish Chochme is drawing on this idea of Ein Biyado Lachazira. That's what makes it Esh. That's what makes it Chetz. That's what makes it Adam HaMazik. You did this. Don't say it's it's your money. Don't say it's your object. It's your arrow. It's your fire. It's you. Because once you did the action, whether it was igniting the fire or it was shooting the arrow, at that point, Ein Biyado Lachazira. And that's the problem with Lashon Hara. Once you've said it, it's out. There's nothing you can do. It doesn't help saying, I'm sorry. It's nothing. It doesn't help saying, I didn't mean it. You've shot the arrow. Lashon Hara is like a chetz. It's not like a cherev. It's like an arrow. It's not like a sword. It's not like a sword. So this, the Apostle can hear me out talking about how people are deceitful in the way they speak, how they talk nicely to people in front of them and badly behind them. But the Lashon Hara piece, the Navi Yirmiyar compares to a chetz, just like Esh. Chetz shachut l'shonam mirma diber. Because once you've let that word out, you can't pull it back again. And that's why the Chofetz Chaim says, not only the Chofetz Chaim, but he's the, the master of it and says it so many times, learning to discipline our tongues is something that teaches us discipline in all sorts of other areas as well, because it's one of the hardest areas to discipline. And if we just get disciplined about what we say, we become disciplined about many, many things. And that's why 
Mi ha'isha chafetz chayim, if you want life, netzol l'shon chamerah. Why doesn't it say all the other things you need to do? If it starts with the l'shon chan, netzol l'shon chamerah, then usvatecha medabe mima, then su meira, then aset tov. There's kind of a sequence that all starts with netzol l'shon chamerah, just be, being very conscious that once a word is out, it can't be retrieved. The hurt is done, the damage is done, and, and yes, you can try and ease it a little bit by saying, I didn't mean it, it was my intention, but we know that all those things don't, don't really help. And then the Lachonara has its own momentum, and just like the fire that gets blown by the wind, people talk, people transmit it, uh, and, and so it goes. And, and in our times, we have to be quite careful with Lashon Hara, not just in the normal sense that we're all familiar with, um, but in our times, but less so right now, because the country is in, in such a good space uh, from a, a moral perspective and a, and a spiritual perspective and a social perspective. Um, but if you go back to October the 6th and, and the year before that, we weren't in such a good space. And there was a lot of Lashon Hara. Now, you know, one, one wants to be free to express one's political opinions, but there's a difference between expressing a political opinion and character assassination. And what's happened in the Western world over the last decade or two is we don't have the intellectual stature and the moral caliber to engage in debate. And so we don't. We just assassinate character. You're an idiot. Instead of saying, I disagree with you. Well, why do you disagree with me? Let's have a conversation. Uh, I don't have confidence in my ability to debate, so I write you off. Uh, if I'm on the right, I write the left off. If I'm on the left, I write the right off. If I'm a Paredi, I write off the Chironim or vice versa. And it's all of this character assassination. It all fits into this Lashonara, this hate that we send out. Every time we say something like that or write it in a newspaper or read it because we Mechabel Lashonara as well. You might say, I'm just reading an, an, a, a harmless article. I'm reading a piece um, about Bibi Netanyahu or about uh, some Hasidic Rebbe. It doesn't matter about who. But if it's about the assassination of the person's character rather than disagreement with their viewpoints, then we're into the Lush and Horror field. It doesn't matter what's going on. We're listening to it, we're accepting it, or, we, or we're talking it. So this idea of the, our tongue is, the, is an arrow, our tongue is a bullet, our tongue is a missile, uh, and, and we need to watch it carefully and hold it back, because once it, we let it go, there is no getting it back, there is no pulling it back. Uh, shalat, it can't be brought back, and that really results in, in an enormous amount of, uh, of, of damage. Um, yes, Fred, the, the idea of the feather-filled filled pillow, the same, the same idea, isn't it? You, uh, you can't put it back. It doesn't come back after that. Any questions or comments? I guess people are afraid to shoot their arrows after such a shear. <laughs> I... Thanks. Thanks to you all. Lovely to learn with you. Sorry, I'll miss you over the next two weeks. And uh, I'm sure you'll have, have a good time and, and, and learn one wonderful Torah and the Shir in this slot and then the other two Shir in that follow it. Uh, and look forward to seeing you when I get back and hope you and your family stay well and safe and that we get some good news going forward. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for a fascinating and important, very important Shir, especially at these times. It's always important to remember Thank this thing. And uh, we wish you a Nesia Tova. And as uh, Hashem see you on your, uh, on your return. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Okay, we will reconvene at 11 o'clock or uh, for the next show.